Good morning, everybody. I apologize for all the technical difficulties that uh, I had uh, on Sunday. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my computers, like myself, are uh, getting old. Um, and we can't multitask the, the, the way we used to. Uh, hopefully, by the time the next, se next session comes around, I'll have a new computer and everything will be working fine and dandy. But in the meantime, I've decided to uh, record this talk so, and so you can uh, see it. So I am going to, incidentally, I am sitting in front of a picture of an actual library uh, in, in Germany. And if I could, this is where I would live, right in the library. So I'm going to go to share my screen. Very good. Okay, this is uh, session seven, which is a recapitulation of the first uh, six sessions, but doing it with kind of a different spin and providing more in the way of her story than his story. Um, the fact of the matter is that m much of American Jewish history is presented as his story. Uh, in fact, much of history, period, uh, is presented as his story uh, because it's men who write the histories. Uh, those who have power uh, write, write the histories, uh, which can be shown on on the side of the slide here of the writers of history among men and among women. Um, now, now, Jewish history, uh, first of all, in, in American Jewish history, at the outset, most of the migration was men. So it would definitely be his story. Um, but over time, women came as well. Uh, men occupied positions of power relative to women. And as I said, men have written most of the histories. Uh, here are uh, three books uh, about women, Jewish women in America. Uh, it, I've read the one in the middle. Uh, it's excellent. And I came across uh, the, other, the other two. Uh, they are all incidentally either written or edited by women. And you can find more information from this particular uh, website here. Now, the years of, of American history from the colonial period to the end of the 19th century include the period of colonial settlement, the revolution, the establishment of a new nation, and dare I say, the peaceful transition of power uh, from one president to the next. Uh, national expansion, uh, both uh, geographically and economically, reform, uh, civil war and reconstruction, and the rise of industrial America. Uh, there have been three basic eras of Jewish migration up through, oh, let's say 1924, when uh, immigration was, uh, was decreased uh, tremendously by American law. Uh, the first was the Sephardic. Uh, these were people, uh, many of whom uh, left the Netherlands to which they had fled after being tossed out of either Spain in 1492 or uh, Portugal, and I believe 1497, uh, Baruch Spinoza's family uh, had left Portugal. Uh, 
and, and went to the Netherlands. Um, this was followed by Central European uh, immigration, mainly from the German states, uh, Germany not being a, a single country until uh, the, towards the end of the 19th century, 1870, 71. Um, the, and there were two waves. There was the wave up to 1848 uh, and the wave after 1848. And in 1848, uh, there were a series of revolutions uh, uh, throughout Europe. Uh, many Jews had supported revolution uh, against the existing monarchies or princely states. Uh, and when the monarchies uh, won out, uh, some Jews fled. Before that, though, uh, there were times of, of uh, economic uh, dislocation uh, and despair and people uh, left uh, Central Europe looking for uh, a better place to live. There had been uh, a particularly long uh, couple of winters uh, following a volcanic ex uh, explosion, uh, putting ash into the atmosphere. Uh, which ruined crops and uh, caused food shortages and famine. Uh, after about 1880, uh, the main migration was from uh, Eastern Europe, particularly Russia uh, uh, and areas of Poland, some of which were uh, controlled by Russia. And this was promoted by the uh, not only uh, economic necessity, but also the czarist pogroms. Well, by 1730, uh, immigrants from Germany outnumbered immigrants from the Sephirad, uh, but there just weren't that many Jews. I mean, it, you know, by the time of the revolution, it, there are only about 2,500 total. And they lived primarily uh, along the Eastern seaboard you can see some of the main uh, areas of, of uh, Jewish uh, life where we have these little stars of David. And this is where there were uh, synagogues. Okay. Um, but they were up and down uh, the, e the eastern seaboard, which of course is where the colonies were. Jewish women in colonial North America occupied traditional roles, traditional roles uh, within the Jewish community and traditional roles within the larger society. By and large, they couldn't serve in positions of leadership either in the Jewish community, uh, in the synagogue or the general community. Uh, at this time, they were not known to have had their own social organizations. And their primary occupation was that of homemaker, although uh, some kept lodgings. Uh, interestingly, the Jewish women in colonial uh, South and Central America uh, had tended to have bigger roles uh, in the economy than they did in, in North America, although it's not entirely clear to me why that was, uh, why that was the case. Uh, this is uh, Abigail Levy. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her right now. Or, well, not right now, but uh, marriage was a central life event. Uh, Jewish women uh, at marriage aged about 23, men about 10 years older. Uh, women tended to marry uh, Jews, uh, men also tended to marry Jews, but were more likely, uh, but but were more likely than women to uh, marry non-Jews, uh, and it wasn't easy finding a partner uh, because there just weren't that many Jews, so they had to look among Jewish communities elsewhere in North America, uh, in the Caribbean, and England, and so that marriage created these networks of personal ties that spanned the Atlantic world. Uh, for women, it was also a 
life of disruption. Uh, they had generally had to move to their husband's community. Uh, many of the husbands were merchants and they traveled and sons were often posted to distant ports. So Abigail Levy was born in London of uh, Jewish uh, German immigrants. Uh, the family moved to New York City by six, uh, 1695, it had been taken over uh, uh, by England. Uh, and in 1712, uh, she got married to another London-born Jew, uh, also uh, of German origin, uh, and they had nine children. They were uh, very active in New York's Jewish life. They belonged to the congregation, the first uh, synagogue uh, in uh, North America. Uh, it was founded, uh, well, the, the, they actually didn't have a synagogue until 1728. The congregation was founded in 1655 and they met in uh, members' houses. Uh, what they did first before they had a synagogue, uh, 70 years before they had a synagogue, was to establish a Jewish cemetery. Uh, Abigail Levy was also active in broader Christian society and she had many uh, Christian friends. Uh, she raised her children as practicing Jews. Uh, both daughters and sons received instruction in Hebrew. They kept kosher, kept Jewish holidays, um, but they never uh, achieved the kind of financial stability that, uh, that they had in England. And one by one, the children were sent to England in order to prosper. And it is very likely that uh, Abigail uh, never saw her adult children uh, after they left or any of her English grandchildren. Uh, and for the remainder of her life, they kept in contact by the exchange of letters. And 33 of her letters uh, all of them to her son, Naftali, have survived. Uh, uh, in them, she urged Naftali in England to keep up with his morning devotions and not to eat uh, non-kosher food and warned him off even his uncle's table. Uh, she was very well read. Uh, her favorite authors were Alexander Pope, Fielding, Smollett, Dryden, Montesquieu, Addison, and Gentlemen's Magazines, which were, you know, kind of the main uh, intellectual fair in England, and the books and magazines were supplied to her by her son. She was also very critical of much in Judaism, and she yearned for a Luther or a Calvin to reform what she deemed Judaism's worst superstitions, but she still followed all the practices. She was scathing in her critique of the New York Jewish community, calling its ladies a stupid set of people and despairing about the pool of Jewish suitors available uh, for her daughters. Uh, another Jew, this uh, who lived uh, during this time, uh, was Abigail Minnis, and she was from in the South. Uh, she and her husband and two daughters were among the first uh, Jews to arrive in Savannah. Uh, Savannah being the, the, the capital or the, the, the main town in the colony of Georgia that was founded by James Oglethorpe. Um, Over the next uh, 20 some odd years, she had seven more children. She was widowed at age 56 and had eight children to support. Uh, she went on to build a small fortune in land. And in 1763, she applied for a license to operate a tavern. And she and her daughters carried this on until 1779. And this became uh, a you know, a uh, main watering hole for the colony's elite, not only the Jews, but the, the non-Jews as well. And she was a very strong supporter of the Revolutionary War against England. 
Now, for the Jews in the hinterlands, first of all, there weren't that many, uh, but the few that, that they were at this time, uh, keeping a Jewish home was challenging. And one Rebecca Samuels, who with her watchmaker husband settled in rural Virginia, wrote to her parents in Germany, the way we live here is not life at all. Jewishness is pushed aside. We do not know what the Sabbath and holidays are. Now, I have to tell you that why they needed a, a, a watchmaker in rural Virginia, I have no idea, but there you are. So few in number, concentrated mainly in the Eastern seaboard and in the cities, uh, Jews were an important part of the commercial and social life. And then came the revolution. Uh, Grace uh, Nathan uh, was a strong supporter of the revolution. She was born in Stratford, Connecticut. Uh, her husband was a merchant and another patriot. Uh, she was a sister of literary skilled and learned men and began writing poetry as a young woman and continued to do this uh, inter, until her death, although none of her work was published during her lifetime. Um, and this is uh, one of her, her poems, which you can uh, read at your leisure, but it, uh, I found it quite moving, quite moving within those walls made sacred to the dead, where yet no spade has rudely turned a sod, no requiem chanted for a spirit fled, no prayer been offered to the throne of God. Anyway, she was a pretty good poet. Now, among the most famous Jews uh, of, of early America was Rebecca Grotz, who I talked about uh, in a previous lecture, uh, but it, it's worth uh, repeating to those who've heard it and worth hearing about, about it by those who haven't heard it yet. Uh, she was born in Pennsylvania, uh, German Jewish extraction. She never married, although she received many authors, offers. Uh, apparently she, uh, received an offer from a Gentile whom she loved, but decided not to marry. Um, she was famous for a couple of things. The first is that she played a huge role in getting women to do so-called good works. And she helped establish the Female Association for the Relief of Women and Children in Reduced Circumstances which helped women whose families were suffering after the American Revolutionary War. And casualties and damage in the American Revolution were very, very high. Uh, in 1815, after, after seeing the need for an institution for orphans in Philadelphia, where she had moved, she was instrumental in founding the Philadelphia Orphan Asylum. Uh, she was among the founders of the Female Hebrew Benevol Benevolence Society. Uh, big supporter of uh, social services. Uh, and this social services organization was created by a group of women from Congregation Mikveh Israel to support Jewish women uh, who found themselves in bad circumstances for whatever reason. And if that weren't enough, she started Hebrew Sunday School, uh, the first of its kind in America. And this was in 1838. She became the superintendent and the president and assisted in, in developing its curriculum. But she was also famous in another way because Washington Irving was a close friend of the Gratz family and she knew uh, Sir Walter Scott and Rebecca Gratz. Uh, and Rebecca Gratz was close to Irving's fiance who had died of consumption or tuberculosis. Well, Irving went to Scotland and visited uh, Walter Scott and described her wonderful beauty and related the story of her firm adherence to a religious faith under the most trying of circumstances. Uh, and she, she became the model for Rebecca in Walter Scott's 
uh, novel, Ivanhoe, who loves Lancelot, but will not marry him. Now, after the revolution, uh, America expanded uh, tremendously in size. Uh, first, from the, from the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Revolutionary War, America or the United States went as basically as far as the Mississippi River, okay? Uh, although there weren't states over here yet. Uh, Florida was added, uh, different parts of the Gulf Coast were added, the Louisiana Purchase in 1803 uh, because Napoleon uh, needed the money because he was being bled white by the Peninsula War, uh, which was his attempt to uh, conquer Spain, uh, and so on. Territory was one thing, but you had to get to that territory. And during this period after the revolution, turnpikes and canals were built, and eventually uh, railroads. And that's how people got, you can see there's Cleveland over here and Erie and Sandusky, uh, Cincinnati became a, became a big town, Louisville, and basically anywhere there's a railroad station, there are Jews. And these were also the beginning paths for the main uh, occupation of uh, new immigrants, which was peddling being merchants on the road, and they filled the spaces in between the lines. Now, in the Civil War, Jewish women, like their Gentile neighbors, like, like their husbands, uh, were on both sides. Um, if you lived in the South, you were more likely to support the South. If you lived in the North, you were more likely to support the North. There were Jews in the South who owned slaves. Uh, not out of proportion to the population as a whole, and the and the number of slaves they tended to have was was small, mostly household uh, slaves. Uh, on both sides of the Mason Dixon line, they kept the home fires burning. Uh, they had to take care of things uh, when their husbands were uh, in the army. Um, they they made new female benevolent associations. Uh, the Jews of, of Washington, D.C. placed an appeal uh, to the Jewish Messenger a newspaper in, in New York, in which they noted, unlike you in New York, we have no fun to support the families of poor soldiers. And the unhappy consequence is the wives and the children of these poor men are in abject want, and uh, Jews from New York sent money to Washington. Uh, Simon Wolf. Uh, so what did they do uh, at home? They raised money. Uh, Simon Wolf reported about a fair that the Hebrew societies uh, had a table at, uh, and, they, and they got $756, uh, and the entire receipts were, you know, 10 grand, all honor to our fair Jewesses. Uh, in Philadelphia, the congregation uh, that Rebecca Gratz had belonged to, Mikvah Israel, turned the synagogue into a hospital. And the various Jewish women societies started producing uniforms for men in the Union Army. And as, as I mentioned early, early in a previous lecture, that many of the uniforms uh, uh, in the Union Army were very, very badly made. Uh, they were made using a material that was called shoddy, which was kind of leftover stuff. Uh, and that term uh, came to mean what it means today, uh, you know, like shoddy merchandise, basically crap. Uh, women in various cities uh, in the North and in the South. Uh, founded, you know, soldiers' aid societies. Um, uh, 
uh, a couple of uh, women of the Confederacy, uh, the Levy sisters. Eugenia was a spy and she was jailed twice for it. Uh, and uh, her sister, Phoebe, uh, was a nurse uh, and she, you, she made her mark by feeding the wounded with her chicken soup. And, uh, you know, I think this kind of sums it up that they did the best they could and they had to accept bravely all that was left. And they were on the losing side. So, women had two roles. They had work, which was much of which was at home. Uh, and good works, but as Eastern European immigration began uh, and the numbers began to increase dramatically, uh, women had to find work. And where did they work? In the rag trade. Jews had been peddlers in the rag trade. Uh, many of them had been tailors. My own grandfather, uh, who came over uh, somewhere around 1900 or so, uh, had been apprenticed to uh, a tailor before he came uh, to America. Uh, and they were in the rag trade, making clothes. And first they worked at home, in home sweatshops, uh, and then in factories. And you'll notice that uh, nothing wrong with uh, with child labor here. Everyone was making clothes and it was all piecework. It was not by the hour, it was by the piece. Now, the attitude of the American Jewish community, which was basically the German uh, uh, American Jewish community towards Eastern European immigration, uh, included a lot of resentment because German Jews were mostly reform now uh, and were reasonably well off, or at least as well off as everybody else in America. Uh, and they looked down on these uh, Eastern European immigrants who came uh, to America with basically nothing. But that wasn't the only part of their attitude. The other part of their attitude was in social activism to contribute to the welfare protection and education of these new immigrants. They founded the Hebrew Immigrants Aid Society of, of New York, and they agitated for mission work um, uh, among the tenements. These were the uh, apartment buildings where, uh, which were really rat traps and death traps where people lived. And in this social activism, there was a major, major role for America, for Jewish women. So I'm gonna tell you about one Jewish woman by the name of Lillian Vault. Um, I really didn't know anything about her until I, I read that book that, that I mentioned in, in the second slide, I think. She was born in Cincinnati, uh, the third of four children, uh, German Jewish extraction. Uh, her family had left after the 1848 revolutions. Uh, in 1878, they moved to Rochester, New York where she considered this to be her uh, hometown. Uh, she was educated at an English French boarding school and was excellent in science, math, and the arts. And uh, her family was a member of the Reform Temple, but she received no uh, formal uh, Jewish training. At 16, she applied to Vassar, but was refused because she was too young. Well, soon thereafter, she happened to, she was attended the birth of her sister, Julia's child, and was so inspired by the work of the attending nurse that she decided to become a nurse herself. And she enrolled at the New York Hospital Training School. Now, the New York Hospital at this time was in the forefront of the medical field. It adopted practices like sterilizing sheets, 
uh, and surgical instruments and applying disinfectants to the hands of hospital staff. And heavens to Murgatroyd, they began, they staff also used masks during operations. Um, the hospital uh, instituted a Florence Nightingale inspired uh, nurse training program uh, a few months after the hospital opened in uh, 1877. And there it is. And different parts of the hospital, a ward, place where people could uh, do some exercise, get some fresh air. And this is Lillian Vault. This is a children's surgical ward at now Bellevue Hospital. She graduated in 1891. She started work at a juvenile asylum and an orphanage, but she quickly became disillusioned with institutional methods. Uh, this is what the Lower East Side where she lived looked like. This is Remington Street, I've been there. Uh, so she decided to go to medical school. So she, applied, she enrolled in Women's Medical College in New York City, but found that medicine was too focused on physiology and not enough on people. Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Same thing. Uh, so she left, uh, same thing today. Uh, she left medical school uh, and in 1893, she agreed to teach a class in home nursing and hygiene to immigrant women on the Lower East Side, like this area, and she loved it. She absolutely loved it, and that became her life's work. Uh, one day she was teaching a child, and uh, the little girl asked her to, you know, please look at her sick mother at home, uh, and the child uh, led her through these tenements over broken roadways between tall reeking houses in uh, England. These kinds of tenements were called rookeries. Uh, they were so packed with people and garbage and it was really awful. Um, and walked up the rear of a tenement by slimy steps and finally to the sick room and she decided Vall decided to uh, dedicate her life's work to the tenement community. Um, she wrote that this was a baptism of fire. Deserted were the laboratory and academic work of college. I'd never return to them. I rejoiced that I had training in the care of the sick that in itself would give me an organic relationship to the neighborhood in which this awakening had come. She practiced community nursing. She even coined the term public health nurse in 1893 for the nurses who worked outside hospitals in poor and middle class communities. She and a friend established the visiting nurse service. And you can see here, this is, uh, these are tenements. Of course, there's no air conditioning. Uh, and if you've been in New York in the summer, it's pretty awful without air conditioning. Uh, and people would sleep out uh, outside to the degree that they, to the, that they could. She founded a place that could organize all this called the Henry Street Settlement. And there it is. Uh, it was based on the principle that everyone should have access to health care. Can you imagine? What an idea. Uh, it provided preventive care, health education, home care that reduced hospital time. It's only about 100 years before its time. Uh, care for children during a parent's hospitalization and social programs. Here are uh, Lillian Wald and uh, her friend, Mary Brewster. Uh, 
and there are some of the visiting nurses and just they could have just as easily had the same uh, or a very similar uh, motto as the use as the US Post Office. Neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night shall stay these couriers from the swift completion of their pointed rounds. Except these couriers were carrying medical instruments and knowledge. Uh, this is a very, very famous photo of uh, a visiting nurse going from one apartment to another, and it was easier to cross by way of the roofs of the tenements than it was to go all the way downstairs, negotiate outside, and walk back upstairs. And here she's a uh, visiting nurse in a home, uh, dealing with a baby, here's another kid. This, you know, this is not a wealthy place. Uh, so the Henry Street uh, settlement uh, provided health care, social services, classes in everything from English to music, infant care, cooking and sewing classes, dance classes. They built the first playground in New York City. There's a playground. Uh, I think this was a basket weaving class. A cooking class. And of course, if you're going to have a cooking class, you got to have a cookbook. I think they even sold this cookbook to, to make some money. Uh, they taught how to set up a table. Okay, and here's a, here's a recipe if you want to make it. I haven't made this, but there you are. Matzah fruit fritters. Uh, she started a series of lectures to educate prospective nurses at Columbia University's Teachers College. And students attended classes at Columbia and that they got field training at the Henry Street Settlement. And this led to the formation of the university's Department of Nursing and Health in 1910. Uh, I am a, a graduate of Columbia, both uh, under, uh, both Columbia College and the medical school. So I'm pretty proud of this kind of stuff. She was also a political activist for both women's suffrage and racial justice. Her settlement houses not only provided services, but employed members of all racial and ethnic groups. She insisted that Henry Street's classes be racially integrated. And there was a branch of it in, uh, in uh, Harlem, uh, I believe, known as the Lincoln House, which served the African-American community and it was known for its extensive research on the lives of Blacks. She was involved with the National Negro Conference, a gathering held at Henry Street. And the conference became the founding meeting of the NAACP. Uh, she joined with the NAACP in 1915 to protest the release of the film, The Birth of a Nation which celebrated the KKK and its belief in white uh, supremacy. This was the very famous D.W. Griffith uh, film. Um, at the time of the convention, um, the uh, It was said it was you know too serious unless there was some social provision. So so she suggested having a party at the house, uh, but the organizing committee was fearful. Oh no, it won't do. As soon as white and colored people sit down and eat together, there begin to be newspaper stories about social equality. Heavens heavens above. Uh, but she responded, but 200 members of the conference couldn't sit down. Our house is too small. Everyone would have to, everyone would have to stand up for supper. Uh, and the party was successful. 
She participated in the New York State Women's Suffrage Campaign. The task of organizing human happiness needs the active cooperation of man and woman. It cannot be relegated to one half of the world. Uh, following World War I, uh, there was a red scare. Well, following World War I and the Russian Revolution, uh, there was a red scare. and. Uh, She had been labeled radical. Uh, she was anti-war. She had endorsed socialist candidates. She had. Uh, she was associated with people like Emma Goldman. Uh, she defended immigrant aliens, uh, and uh, even her neighborhood uh, celebrated the success of the Russian Revolution. But uh, following this, there was a there was a real uh, reaction uh, on the part of uh, the U.S. government, um, which was extremely anti-communist. Many people don't know that the U.S. invaded uh, Russia after the revolution. Um, she, in fact, accepted an invitation to go to see communist Russia for herself. Um, and she uh, supported the idea that the government should recognize Russia as a country, which it hadn't done uh, so far. She was uh, she was not a socialist, as far as I can tell, uh, much less a communist. But she was uh, she was radical in her own way. Um, I think this is a wonderful quotation. Reform can be accomplished only when attitudes are changed. And uh, this is where she's buried in Mount Hope uh, Cemetery. Uh, for enrichment, if you want to learn a little bit more, there's a lecture by Dr. Henry Abramson uh, on YouTube. There's this website, thelillianwall.com, which, which has a ton of information. Uh, about her life, and it's where I took a lot of a lot of this. Um, and uh, this is my main uh, source for this uh, class, but I've also used these other books as well. And for reference later on, this is just a timeline that you could read uh, at your leisure. I would like to. Uh, Thank you very much for listening. And um, I look forward to having my computer problems fixed uh, by the next time. Till the next R-Tent, have a good week. Bye-bye.